they occasionally do surveys about what people fear the most. Last year, the three top fears were corrupt public officials, not having enough money, and the possible death of a loved one. Big fears. Of course, last year, COVID raced up onto those lists. But really, statistically speaking, we should remain more fearful of cardiovascular disease and cancer. But we have a lot of fears. In fact, on these lists, five very specific fears always appear. Public speaking, heights, bugs, clowns, and zombies. Very specific fears. In fact, if you want to now imagine the most possibly terrifying scene, imagine this. You have to give a public speech to a crowd of clowns and zombies. And you're standing on a ledge. And a spider is crawling up your arm. Okay, wait. I know a spider is not a bug, but you get my point. We have a lot of fears. And that one about public speaking, it reappears again and again every year. And people are always asking me, you're a preacher. Don't you get nervous to give a public talk? Yes. I get super nervous. I'm standing alone right now in a room, well, except for Tom and the camera, and I'm still nervous. It's nerve-wracking to have to talk publicly. But as a minister, you get used to being nervous. You just get used to that feeling in your gut. I've given some 5,000 sermons. I have to preach every week. I'm used to being nervous. But what is really nerve-wracking is not just standing in front of people. It's having something meaningful to say every week. That's nerve-wracking. And Christian preachers are always preaching just about one of three things. Always. There's only really three Christian sermons. God loves you. Jesus is awesome, and be nice to other people. That's pretty much what I've been preaching about for 31 years, but you have to find new ways to illumine that. And actually, every week I'm inspired by those three different sermons. Every week, God loves you. Every week I want to tell you, you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. I know you might feel judged somehow by God, or you feel some guilt. You are loved so far beyond that, any of that, whether you are gay or straight or any political persuasions. You have been made by God, wonderfully, reverently made by God. I can get inspired to say that to people every week. And Jesus is awesome. He is. He's amazing that type of connection to God, unity with God, the type of divine light that shines forth in Him. He is awesome, and I want to talk about it every week and, and be nice to other people. I want to talk about us growing in compassion every week. It still inspires me. And be nice to other people, that also means fairness and justice, seeking social justice. I get inspired by those three themes every week. Well, we do have a lot of fears, but let's go into Scripture. I want to talk about fear today, but let's first go to the Bible. We're in Mark chapter 6. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Jesus said to them, well then now come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For so many had been coming and going, they had no leisure even to eat. Notice here that Scripture recognizes that we all need that rhythm between work and rest. That we all need rest and Sabbath and leisure. They went away in a boat to a deserted place. Now many saw them and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, a great crowd began to form, and Jesus had compassion for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them. Wherever he went, crowds formed. All through the Gospel of Mark, crowds are constantly forming. Why? 
because he's so magnetic. He is simply so attractive. He draws people. By attractive, I don't mean his looks. We have no idea what Jesus looked like. Nowhere in Scripture does it tell us what Jesus looked like. He was probably a lot shorter and stockier than you think. The average height of a male in Palestinian first century is about five foot two, and he was a woodworker or a construction worker. He was probably stockier than you think. We don't know what he looks like, though, but he's attractive in the sense that you are drawn to him because you see that connection to God. Oh, if the church could remember this, that we simply have to be as much like Jesus as we can as a church, that, that we simply have to manifest that type of divine light and the crowds will form. You can hire church strategy consultants that will come up with all these strategies to be a church. There's one strategy, my friends. Be Christ-like. If the church can manifest that spirit, the crowds will come. They crossed again over the lake and when they got out of the boat, the people at once recognized him. And they rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into the villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces at his feet and begged him that they might even touch the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. Remember, Jesus in some primary way is a healer. Jesus comes to heal the wounded in all the ways that we might be wounded. Jesus is a healer. Did you notice in the Gospel of Mark how he's on the move all the time? I mean, remember, we are a religious movement, not a religious standstill. Jesus is on the move. We need to be on the move with him. But I want to look at one line in this scripture. Did you notice it said that they recognized him at once? It says, the people recognized him. What are they seeing in him? I'm not sure it's just that they knew what he looked like. It means they're seeing something in him. Probably, primarily, they can see a holy one. When someone is so connected to God, united with God, of God, that light just sort of shines. People can tell when they're in the presence of a holy one. I've heard it said that the Dalai Lama, when you walk into a room with the Dalai Lama, the joy and the centeredness just radiates him like he's illumined. It would have been that way with Jesus. Of course they recognize a holy one. But I also think they see something else immediately. Something that makes him stand apart. They see that he has no fear. We're beset by so many fears. We're racked by so many anxieties, but they immediately recognize here is someone who is fearless. I don't mean in a way of machismo or some sort of heroic, crazy courage. I mean he is calm and centered and fearless. And oh my, he had faced so many fearful circumstances in his life but it didn't overcome him. Remember when he was a toddler, they had to, the whole family had to escape to Egypt because an evil king was trying to kill him. He had faced peril. He was in harm's way his whole life, starting as a toddler. Then he comes back and then as an adult in his ministry, the Sadducees and Pharisees conspired to kill him. Remember, he finds himself in the middle of a knife fight or a sword fight and he shows no fear. Remember that he goes right to the center of power and culture at the temple and he throws over the table showing no fear, fear of the powers that be. Remember that he went to his death with no fear. Well, here's the Jesus' is awesome part of this sermon. He's fearless. He's so centered. We can be trapped in our fears and it's our fears that make it hard to really love others. Here's the how to be nice to others part of the sermon. It can be hard to be centered and love others if we're so fearful. That's why every single week I end the sermon or the service by saying, let your faith be stronger than your fear. It's our faith, this love that tries to cast out our fears. 
again and again in Scripture. It's saying, fear not. Do you know, about 103 times our Bible says, do not be afraid or fear not. 103 times. Remember in Psalm 23, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. No fear. Oh, the Psalms say this to us again and again. In Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Let your faith be stronger than your fear. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Oh, the Psalms. In 46, it says to us again, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in our trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth will change, the waters will be in tumult, the mountains will shake, have no fear. The Bible again and again says that to us. Jesus in John says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. In Matthew, it says, Jesus says, Fear not. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. That's one of our central fears that I'm not really of value, that I don't matter. It's a deep existential fear. Jesus looks right at you and says, Fear not. In 2 Timothy, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and control. Fear not. God has given us a spirit of love and self-control and power. And then in 1 John, it says, There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Our entire faith is poised to teach you to fear not. but we can have so many fears. I remember my first job in high school. It was an awesome job. I lived in Dublin, Ohio. And in Dublin, Jack Nicklaus, best golfer of all time, he had built his masterpiece, Muirfield Village. This golf course is amazing. It's where they hold the memorial tournament on the PGA. And they needed caddies. And I loved golf, big time. So I got a job as a caddy. And I worked hard, and I became an honor caddy at Muirfield Village. That's where you had to learn all the yardages, and, and then you were uh, higher up on the ladder of caddies, and you would do the biggest corporate events and such. And as a high school student, I would be caddying for these CEOs that would come into town, these major corporate events. And I was so nervous at first. These were captains of industry, and I was so afraid that I would do my job okay. But then I realized they were so nervous. This was one of the hardest golf courses in the world, and they were going to shoot about a hundred, and they just were afraid, afraid of embarrassing themselves in front of their colleagues. And I realized my job there as their caddy was to help make them less afraid. Well, you know what? Actually, maybe that was the beginning of my ministry. Because ministry, our faith, if it's about anything, it's helping you be less afraid so you can be calmer, more centered, more present to others. Maybe I started ministry as a caddy, just helping those guys get through the day less afraid. So I'll say to you this day, God loves you. Jesus is awesome. Be nice to others and you can because if you're less afraid, if your faith is stronger than your fear, you can live more fully and in love. Amen.